They came at us with their big fancy cars and their big fancy watches and their big fancy everything. Two of them, dressed with clothes that cost as much as it would cost us to find shelter for the rest of the winter, accompanied by their big baboons of bodyguards. I mean, obviously, John was impressed. You see, we don't have the luxury of seeing those kind of guys often in our industrial wasteland. We see them every day in the city, though. But seeing them in the wastelands, ah, definitely impressive and suspicious. But I was the only one old and wise enough to see that. But these kids, nah, these kids ain't seen half of what men can do when they're in power. They're all getting saucer-eyed at the prospect of escaping the hell that is living on the street. Contrarily to them, I made the conscious choice of being there. So when these big fancy men came with smiles that are more teeth than gentleness, I knew I was looking at wolves in sheep's clothing. What does your heart desire the most? Simple question, really. Built to create dreams and desires and make their minds pliable. Even Martha, who was maybe ten years my junior, was listening with intent. All of them had dreams. We all do. It's not because we live in the streets that we forgot what it's like to dream and have ambitions. John wanted to go back to school and become a vet. Martha wanted to see her daughters again. Aided wanted to transition. And Jeremiah wanted to be able to afford food for his dogs. All valid demands. When they looked at me, my brows furrowed. And I stared back coldly. I want to help. That's all I said. That's all they were getting from me. They'd have to do more than dress pompously and ask about my dreams to get me to open up. However, they seemed pleased with my answers. The two of them wolves actually seemed very satisfied with my answer. Well, considered it handled, they said. And confusion finally started to tint my fellow's face as if they were finally realized that nothing in life was free and that these men aren't there to help without something in exchange. Sure, some of them would probably sell their bodies in an instant if it meant getting what they're dreaming of. Even Martha would. But I doubt anyone would buy it. She's nice, but I can't remember the last time she had a good wash. There were rumors about Martha's cleanliness down there, too and people who had to meet the local pharmacist after a tryst with her. How? I asked them, because obviously, shit ain't gonna happen without us paying our dues. Ain't no rich man wearing a country club vest going to spare his loose change with us in the street for no reason. They don't even look at us. We don't exist. So why now, and how do they intend to handle it? The man in the middle took a step forward. He had a crown of salt and pepper hair, but a rapidly receding hairline. His forehead was wrinkled as he tried to give us an honest expression, but all I could see was a fox preparing his lies to the raven. I ain't given my cheese so easily, fox boy. I thought. How? Charity, of course. Our country club has made more than necessary this year. And if we give to charity a certain percentage, we'll have a bigger tax cut. This year, we wanted to do something special and help our fellow citizens get back on their feet. You five are perfect for that. It's more of a help us out and we'll help you kind of deal. And while the explanation made sense, I was still suspicious. Admitting they wanted to make more money was probably not a lie. I didn't like how confident and arrogant they were about it. Everyone around me started to get excited, but I did not give them the luxury of thinking they had me. One of the bodyguards brought his wrist up to his lips and called for something. Minutes later, there was a black SUV approaching. We were courteously invited to climb in as we would be headed toward the country club to meet with the other privileged members of their micro-society. 
when we arrived. The tables were already covered in more food than the average American family could see in a month. The opulence of it all made me sick to my stomach, but I wasn't one to refuse a good meal and a shower. We were then brought to the showers where I took my damn time cleaning up with their fancy soaps and towels that were so soft I could have made a pillow out of one. After that, we joined them rich pigs to feast, and the five of us got a solid round of applause. I swallowed thickly as John blushed and Martha smiled from ear to ear. Sure, she had a few missing teeth, but seeing her in a dress and heels made her look... Well, almost beautiful. We were given a speech about giving back, but all I could hear was the cheers of egocentric people who think that spending money would erase all the wrongs they did in the world, giving themselves a pat on the back for being so generous and whatnot. Well, they probably wouldn't spare loose change if it wasn't for that tax cut they were looking for. None mattered. If the kids were getting what they wanted, I would swallow back these words and actually thank them. As I walked toward the buffet, I gave a quick glance around. I was about to reach for a shrimp thingy on a cracker when the waiter told me kindly that the guest buffet was on the other side. And sure enough, there was a table with pizzas, chips, and cocoa on the other side. Stealing a canapé anyway, I smiled at the guy. Sure, they wouldn't notice if I take one, but thanks for pointing me in the right direction, buddy. Then I turned around, bit my bite-sized stolen good, and made my way over to the pizza and cocoa. I didn't trust it. I don't know why, but just seeing the food made me want to run. My gut was telling me not to eat it. Even as I saw John scarf down a slice of pizza and giggling with Jeremiah... Now, mind you, I was hungry, but I was very paranoid. I usually am. So, I took a plastic bottle of Coke, some still packaged chips, and decided that this would be my meal for the evening. I suppose that even if I was overly cautious, I couldn't avoid it. We all woke up a few hours later, dressed differently than the clothes they offered us at the country club. I had a bad taste in the back of my mouth, too. Bitter, but between chips and soda, I knew it wasn't that. I don't remember what I did after dinner, either. What time it was now, or where I even was. All I knew is that I was lying on the goddamn ground in a forest. I was surrounded by trees, the ground was moist and cold, and I was dressed in an orange suit. About a minute after I woke up, John Denver's Take Me Home Country Road was blasting throughout the forest with some speakers, and I knew deep down that something bad was about to happen. As much as I love Denver, right now, I'd do anything to shut him up. I stood up slowly helping myself with a nearby tree. I was still shaking on my knees as I scanned my surroundings for a sign of John, Jeremiah, Martha, or Aiden. There were no signs of them. The only sound I could hear beside the branches cracking beneath my feet was Denver's song. It played on repeat, and those old speakers made it sound a little creepier than it should. I started to get afraid. Very afraid. Men with big-time money inviting homeless scraps to feast on the pretext of a donation. I coughed loudly, but my cough was deafened by a sound that was very frightening. A loud bang, and then cheers to my left. My whole body stiffened because I could recognize the sound of a gun, even with my mind in shambles. There was a reason why I was dressed all in bright orange, and a reason why Denver was blasting in the forest. We weren't there to be part of some charity operation. We were the main event for some sort of cruel celebration of the rich. It was about 23 degrees outside, so pretty damn cold. 
I still took off my entire outfit and thanked God that they allowed me to keep my underwear. So there I was, standing all my naked glory at 23 degrees outside, praying that whoever they shot was hit in the head and they didn't suffer. I shivered from head to toe as my back leaned against the bark of a tree, but wearing nothing but socks, boots, and dirty old underwear. There wasn't much I could do. But these fucks, well, they messed with the wrong guy. I'd seen horrors that would make them piss their pants and cry to be back under their mama's skirts in my time as a soldier. It ain't a bunch of well-fed pigs that were going to scare me. I made it back to our great country and decided to live in the street to help those who needed it. I wasn't going to let them take out the kids for their sick game. So I picked up a stick from the ground, tore the branches sticking out of it, and broke the tip. I had nothing to sharpen it, but I'm pretty sure that if I had the advantage of surprise, I could take some of them out. I only needed one gun after all. So I hid. I hid until I heard the branches crack nearby and then held my breath, held it long enough that when the cracking was about a meter behind me, I was about to pass out. I moved slowly from behind the tree as the country club guy stared at my discarded orange outfit on the ground. Dumb luck had it that he didn't see me coming until the last second, and I stuck my stick right into his left eye. I heard him scream for half a second before I was on him, driving the stick further until his skull and shutting him up with my other palm. There was no need for his fellow brethren to know what was coming to them. It was cold to the bones, and now my upper half was stained with blood, but I couldn't care less. I found an iPad on him, but the screen was cracked, and I probably broke it when I slammed into him. I was now armed. Unfortunately, this boy was as big as a twig and I couldn't fit into his pants. All I could do was steal his vest, scarf, and hat. I couldn't button the vest, but it was a bit more dressed, a bit less cold, and now a lot more alert to what the hell was going on. I used my training as a soldier and slithered my way through the forest like a snake. I had no idea how many of them were there. All I knew was that there were five probably four now considering I heard a bang and some cheers. I had to find them boys and Martha before these hunters could. My breath came out like fog out of my lips because of the cold, but soon enough I was smiling warmly again. I was hearing voices. Two of them. I had no effing clue where they were, but I knew they would stand no chance. I got out of my hiding spot and shot the first one in the stomach. Then I reached for the rounds in my pocket as I went back behind the tree. The second idiot did exactly what I expected him to do by shooting the tree and wasting his rounds. The tree was so thick the bullet couldn't go through. As soon as I was loaded again, I got out of my hiding spot and shot him right in his face. I watched in glee as bouts of brain covered the surrounding area, then watched for the belly guy as he grunted on the ground and tried to call for help. I used the butt of my gun to finish him. I slammed it repeatedly against his face and watched in delight as his skull cracked and his eye melted into a puddle of cracked bones, blood, and flesh. His last expression of horror forever distorted by anguish. I stole his ammo and his vest, since he was much fatter. I took his pants too because, well... Heck if I was going to keep freezing my balls off in that hunting game they started. I almost forgot to cheer out loud. Gotta let my other hunters know that another has fallen. <laughs> Hell, I even sang Take Me Home, Country Road, in unison with Denver as I collected a functioning iPad from the guy who shot the tree instead of me. My suspicions were confirmed when I saw our profiles, the number of points we were worth, and the hunter's profiles. There were seven. I was worth 1,200 points. Martha was worth far less at 200 points, and her profile was already grayed out. So, I took it that she was the first victim. 
I felt my heart tighten as I glanced at my three boys, each of them worth 600 points. For some reason, John was already grayed out. Did I miss a shot? Anyway, I don't know how they decided I was worth 1200 points, but they were right. I was a lot more dangerous than anyone else in our little group. I was taken from my calculations by the sound of another loud bang on my far right. I heard Jeremiah's screams, and I started dashing in that direction, hoping that I would make it in time. I was about 500 yards away, but I sincerely hoped I could make it. I was close enough to hear him beg when the final shot exploded in Jeremiah's brains all over the forest floor, and I silenced the cheers of the assailant by shooting one of them and jumping on the other. I felt a pressure in my thigh, and I knew I'd been hit by the other's shooting. But I didn't have the time to worry about myself. There were still two more boys out there who needed my help, and I wasn't going to let these vicious assholes rip the life out of them. Even with a shot to my thigh, I still jumped onto the other and beat him with the butt of my gun. And I didn't stop until I was hitting the ground, and his brain was jammed. I threw my weapon away and grabbed his put the rounds in as country roads started again for the umpteenth time. I felt the pain in my thigh as I stood up and started to stumble my way around the forest. The trees were dancing around me, and my heart thumped loudly. Adrenaline and fury kept me standing. I forgot about the iPad, but I knew there were two left. Two boys, and probably two monsters. I did what any man would do in this situation. Come and take me, country club, I screamed as loudly as I could, and I heard running, so I started running too. I ran until I saw these cowards running toward what I could only hope to be the country club. I stopped running when I had a clear shot and took out one of them. I heard the second one scream and beg, but I started running again. I started running because I wasn't going to let him survive. I wasn't going to let him get away scot-free with what he did to Martha and Jeremiah. I then heard Aiden scream, and I dashed toward the coward, the heavy rock in hand. I heard it as it connected with the man's skull, and I heard him as he sobbed, and Aiden repeatedly slammed the rock against him. Aiden was crying by the time I reached him, and the man was unconscious not exactly dead. I pushed Aiden off the body and I shot the country club guy in the head. That was more mercy than he deserved, but this needed to end. I leaned on Aiden as we walked back toward the country club. I was still holding my gun, because, well, like hell we were getting inside that thing without backup. Fortunately for us, there were only employees when we entered and they all looked more horrified than the next. Someone called the police, and when the police arrived, we were arrested, Aiden and I. We were only cleared after they found Martha and Jeremiah's bodies in the woods, and John's body in the infirmary. The kid had overdosed on whatever it was that they had given us. <laughs>